Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Agility in the Age of the Cloud. I'm Ali McDonald, Senior Associate Digital Editor at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. This event will be recorded and will be available to all attendees approximately three to four business days after the end of the live event. We welcome, you to, we welcome your questions for our speaker today. To submit questions, please enter them anytime in the questions module on the GoToWebinar control panel. You can also submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag MITSMREvent. We'll answer as many questions as time permits. If at any time you're having audio difficulties while listening via computer, please call in via telephone instead or check the help link in the upper part of your console. So our speaker today is Quentin Hardy, who's the head of editorial at Google Cloud. Our thanks go out to Cloudera for their sponsorship of this webinar. Quentin, we're looking forward to your presentation and I'll let you take it from here. Oh, thank you very much, Ali. It's great to be here. And thank you all for taking some of your busy time to work through a talk on agility in the age of the cloud. Let me begin with a disclaimer. I do not speak for Google Cloud in what I am about to say or any of its fine products or services. Uh, some of the context I'll be giving you is based on a course I taught at UC Berkeley while I was a reporter at the New York Times. And other things are based on personal observations of what I've seen going on in tech after writing about it and working with it for a couple of decades. So what I'd like to do today is spend five or 10 minutes on some important historical precedents that tell us a lot about where we're heading and give you some idea of what we can learn from them so that we can look at some interesting trends for management over the next few years. So let's begin with a quote from 1967 that I still find highly germane. This was by John Calkin, a friend of the great media theorist Marshall McLuhan, and he said, we become what we behold. We shape our tools and then our tools shape us. Another way you might say this is that habits create cultures and set standards, that the way we receive and process information has a lot to do with the economic possibilities that are created, the way we deal with each other, the way we organize people and systems. So it's a very important to look at new technologies to get a sense of how habits might change and how we can best organize ourselves and serve the markets of our time. And to get a better sense of that, why don't we look at a couple of noted historical examples before we move into the present day? I'd like to begin in the year 1450. This is a monk just around the time the printing press is invented. And as you can see, he's hard at work uh, working on his manuscript. Books in that time took about a year to complete and they were very large format typically, and that was owing to the reach of a human arm. They would write at these desks and write these very large volumes, um, by the way, often bitching and moaning in the marginalia about how their backs hurt or how this was really a hard job to do. And the final product, which was a year of someone's labor, was extremely valuable. If you look in the background, you can see that these are strapped in, held under lock and key, locked away, and obviously, for the most part, kept in monasteries where only a few people could get at them. But there's a couple of events that start to shape this business in a very big way. Around the middle of the of 1450s, um, Gutenberg obviously invents the printing press, but it takes a few decades for it to really take a form that we would recognize. There's a lot of experimentation with manuscripts and print, or what size should print should be. People print tend to print very large books. And then there are other factors that shape a business, that shape the way the technology is used. Possibly the first big one is the fall of Constantinople in 1454, which opens all of these texts from the Arab world and the classical world that weren't known before into the West and creates this huge business in translation and bibliography and philology, all these ways of telling what a true original version of something is. So there's this translation industry that steps up. 
And of course, this is spurred in 1492 with the discovery of the New World, and everyone wants to read about these new lands and these new peoples and get all this information. Just at exactly the same time that in Venice, pioneers in bookmaking and textual recovery come up with more effective ways to print books. They realize that you don't need this big format. You can fold paper and make smaller books that can be carried in saddlebags. This creates a whole new industry of traveling scholars that feeds into a market of emer emerging bourgeoisie, independent businessmen who are working in what you know is the start of the Renaissance and the growth of our modern world. So let's have a look at what this looks like by looking at 1490. Uh, ignore the dance of death. There's way too much violence in woodblocks these days. Um, but what I want you to pay attention to is that there's a division of labor. One person is sorting the uh, tiles, one person is pressing, one person is selling. And look how much smaller the books are, and they're not locked away anymore. They're freely available. The price collapses, but the volume goes up. Sound familiar? And this new industry is created where. Uh, many, many more people are reading and literacy changes and actually the speed at which language evolved changes, it slows down once it's written down. And certain languages tend to become kind of fixed and dominant. The ways in which German changes into French harden and there are territories of these languages because they become markets for this new vernacular language. And this is the effect of print and the translation industry targeting specific markets that are created because of this technology. Well, to do on a slight tangent, uh, this is also why you get Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation in 1519, because the books are being produced, these translated Bibles are being produced to an audience that can read in the vernacular at a pace faster than the church can collect and burn the volumes. And a lot of things change as a result. Um, including the idea of French speakers and German speakers as unique people, which leads later on to the growth of the nation state. This is a longer study for a much different kind of session. The key idea is the ways in which technology, and in particular communications technology, have huge impacts on the world. To move into a different example, uh, in photography in the 19th century, at the start of the Industrial Revolution, People, once again, kind of imitated their predecessor, the way early books were like manuscripts, and they did portraits that involved people sitting very still because of the technical constraint, but also because it looked like painting. This fed the growing tendency of people to migrate and the great migrations of the 19th century, because you could show people yourself, leave some behind or show people where you were in the new world, and it made it kind of psychologically easier to move on. Perhaps more important, um, it made it, uh, as people realized that this was a unique industry, the way books were different from manuscripts, people started to understand what cameras could do and what photography could be in its own right. And one of the great examples of this was in the Civil War. Matthew Brady started out photographing very formal things, but then the cameras became portable and he took them out in the field and he began to portray the heroism of, and horror, if you will, of everyday life and everyday battle, which proved to be quite resonant with people. The effect of this was very deep in how the war actually ran. In the beginning of the war, you've got people like McClellan, the general for the Union side, very formally portrayed. At the end, you've got a general like Grant, who's pictured slouching and kind of informal, and you've got ordinary soldiers who become heroes as if they'd been generals 50 or 100 years before. Reality in the field, reality in the world starts to become accepted as a form of heroism, if you will, or looked at in a way it couldn't have been before. So that eventually, later in the century, someone like Jacob Rees could go into the slums and take pictures of poor people. And it actually affected laws and social understanding in a way that drawings of the poor in Gin Lane and lithographs and prints by Hogarth just never really affected society. There was something inarguable about, inarguable about photography, excuse me, <clears throat> that affected ultimately the market and the society and the sense of who we are. And the, it's the cousin of 
photography film went on to have another great effect. One more historical antecedent, and I'll bring things closer into the present. Manufacturing. Assembly and manufacturing using standardized parts, an element we can also see involved in what's going on today. What you're looking at here is 1913, kind of the end point of over a century of innovation in standardization and <clears throat> equal parts, equal labor done by people over fixed periods of time. This was actually quite a revolution, starting with um, the idea of measuring things according to a standard reference, which is created in the French Revolution where they utterly worshiped reason and moved away from a kind of natural understanding of the world, if you will, that an inch was three grains of barley laid end to end, or an hour was how far a sundial shadow moved, to a kind of reference on a metric system where analytically they bisected how far the sun was, and like they, they were sort of wrong in how they calculated it. But the key thing is they created this idea of a meter, this abstract distance that everybody worked off of. Now, why is measurement like that interesting to people? Because once you can measure things according to an agreed upon standard, you can build factories that are identical over geography, one place to another. And that means you can create products that are identical to each other. Well, that's fantastic for mass manufacture. It also challenges people to create the idea of repeatable experiences that are identical being something to be desired. And that gives rise to the idea of branding and a demand for identical goods and advertising. So you can see many, many effects from these technological changes. And as they say, one more thing, the other effect, modern management. By measuring and breaking things down, you could break down labor in new ways, people working by the hour, people working by certain amounts of fixed production. And this is a uh, an org chart of the company that became IBM from 1917. And you can see in some ways it almost resembles a factory where you've got the assembly of tasks going up into larger managers and capping at the top with the great you know, head of things. This didn't arise out of nowhere. This was a people reflecting, if you will, you know, staring at the machine and becoming in some ways like it or imitating it to develop a more productive system. And management, if you look at the history of GDP across the world, the advent of management is more influential on the growth of GDP than the Industrial Revolution itself. The ability to organize labor through this blend of military discipline, which was the other large system people knew for organizing people, and machine manufacture, reorganized how things could be done and how you could get formal supply chains, changing our world into a kind of abundance that we have occupied ever since. Okay, I took you through all that so I could talk a little bit contextually about where we are today in the computational world. And one of the great impacts is obviously the World Wide Web, capturing a kind of computing that is highly dispersed and highly consumable, and the way most of us see computing in our day-to-day -day lives throughout everywhere. We should think about this in the context of what other influences might have been happening that shaped this, much the way the Protestant Reformation shaped what happened with print, or excuse me, the um, fall of Constantinople shaped what happened with print, or the metric system shaped what happened with the Industrial Revolution. Um, what has caused this utter boom in the web, um, which we see today? is now at from one page to 4.4 billion pages and so much more. Well, you would point at globalization, you would point at the end of communism and the rise of a kind of high velocity consumerism. Uh, you would uh, targeted marketing um, as something that arises really in the 1950s and 60s, but becomes very commonplace. But long and the short of it, you can see that the model I've shown you about machines and people and economic developments can also be seen in what's going on today. Something that um, we start to find technology, computational technology, 
with its origins in ENIAC in 1946, growing and spreading at an incredible rate as it becomes more accessible and more useful to people. You could almost see it as a kind of ever-increasing series of concentric circles starting from ENIAC in 1946, as I say, to in the mid-50s when the head of IBM supposedly wrote that he could see a need for six or eight computers worldwide to the real growth um, in the 60s, the decoupling of operating systems and applications, mini computers, microcomputers, PCs, network computers, mobile computers, cloud computers, sensors. This is a trend of computing arising from single places and finding more and more places where it is affordable and useful and desirable to people, almost on par with Moore's law, that there is something marching forward that wants computing to be everywhere. And the great expression, I think, for this is cloud computing. That cloud is the great representation of this phenomenon of our time, the, the meta effect, if you will, which is massive amounts of computation at all places available on demand. According to Cisco's Connected Devices study uh, in 2016, there were as many connected devices as uh, doing the math I found almost exactly the number of square miles of inhabitable land on the planet and has increased much since then, which is to say that for us and for our children and grandchildren for the foreseeable future, we will always be within a few steps, really, of a nearly infinite amount of computing power, a nearly infinite amount of storage capacity, far more than we would know what to do with in more circumstances, but then, you know, against programs that will increasingly use more and more of this in interesting ways. So what are some of the key aspects of this, the way we talked about aspects of printing with translation and distribution at, at scale. Um, I would say that inside cloud is the idea of virtualization and fungible systems, that there is fixed machinery, but the functions inside it can change. Workloads can be moved around and uh, efficiencies can be gathered in new ways by changing, if you will, the meaning of that server at that time or that group of servers. That likewise data can be gathered from more sources and stored in more ways and analyzed in more ways. And this is a very big uh, change in the landscape because it means that data goes from being something fixed and semi-permanent in a single context to something purposeful at all times, capable of being reused and reanalyzed for a different context. Uh, another great influence is the way that the speed at which software is created and used and changed has increased dramatically because of cloud computing. Time was you would launch some software, send it out on disks, wait a few months, now you watch, launch over the web, and used to be you'd look at it you know, a week later or a few hours later, now you can see people interacting with it in real time and start to tweak what is successful and what isn't. On the consumer side, you have what's called A-B testing on web pages, where you're pushing the more effective version of something and really changing around in the background the way it works, almost on a continuous basis if you want. So that what Satya Nadella, the head of Microsoft, calls uh, intelligent cloud and intelligent edge, or what Google Cloud uh, talks about when it talks about taking cloud type software into a local context, bringing the cloud everywhere or putting AI everywhere, as many places as it's useful. This is part of this larger phenomenon that we are will see computation everywhere in this very dynamic form and that's going to change how we work. Now, footnote, is this the be all and end all? I have no idea. I mean, this could be 1480 and much more is to come. There may be some final distributed model a la blockchain. I personally do not see it soon. I think what we've got going on now with cloud and mobility is a pretty good system for what we need. But, you know, past performance does not guarantee future behavior. But what are some of the upshots of this? Okay. 
devices everywhere, devices wherever you want, 50 billion connected devices by 2020, 328 million devices connect every month. The growth, what you saw in the web pages, will also happen in the outer world with sensors and connected vehicles. And as that happens, these connected devices become much more like web pages too. A cell phone or a Tesla, some other kinds of connected cars change in their function from the time you buy them to a month or two after you own them because you've loaded things on them or they've updated over the air. You buy products, but then the products change as well. This connected devices will affect that in so many more ways, particularly as the devices themselves have software built in that is attuned to react to that. The other thing that happens is I've got Batushig, I won't try the name, um, I say well, Megan Gabayar, um, the genius who aced MIT's course in circuits. At 15 years old, we could find a genius and he could rise up. This is wonderful news and not just for Batushig. One of the lucky things Albert Einstein had in his time was he was in Geneva. If Albert Einstein had been in you know, Madagascar, no one would ever have heard of him. But the world's capabilities and the world's awareness of what others can do is about to accelerate dramatically. And that's wonderful. There is no genius deficit. We'll be genius rich. And that's another way of saying, though, that all sorts of types will be able to find each other. And we find all kinds of self-organizing groups in our political systems today that are causing certain tensions. Uh, we will find capabilities of people rising up in organizations and self-organizing. And it's the job of managers to kind of foster this in healthy ways by identifying needs and problems and capabilities of people who can organize to serve certain tasks and then disassemble. The other area I want to talk about is work. There are now 1.5 million Uber drivers, Airbnb, you can see these things. Uh, this is not to be a Pollyanna about this. When you have big technology changes and the structures of work change, the structures of markets change, there's a lot of disruption. And there are a lot of questions for society to answer around what healthy wages are, what education should be like, um, what dependability, perhaps the biggest factor right now in our system, should look like. Can people count on having this kind of work a year or two from now? But those are things we need to work out and think about ahead of time. By the way, thinking about them ahead of time would put us first among people who've had a new technology and actually engaged with it. Usually, people just suffer the results. Obviously, as I said, there will be a lot of tension inside what employment is, and we see that in the popular press. But there are also uh, many new jobs that are going to be created and have been created. Here's a few I listed off the top of my head. App developer, data scientist, scooter renter. You, these didn't exist 10 years ago. Will they become huge? Hard to say. Cloud architect, cloud manager? Almost certainly. And we're here to talk about cloud management primarily. So I'd like to talk about some of the hallmarks of cloud management and agility in the cloud, beginning with a quote from 1998 from Peter Drucker, who put his finger on this very early, talking about the information age that began with ENIAC. He said that information society created by the computer is a new basic kind of civilization where it's the organizing principle for work, but it takes its cues not from the mechanical world and that factory world I showed you with those org charts and that standardization, but of a new kind of biological rather than mathematical, mathematical process. And in this sense, he really was a prophet because we can see in the way consumption works today and the way production works today and the way the web and increasingly the physical world works today that we're having more and more objects that create specifically for us, that learn us, that interact with us. And this is much more like a biological system than it is a manufacturing system. Think about um, any, any ecology where this system is aware <clears throat> of its interactions. It tries a lot of prototyping in the form of new species, 
or you know larger and shorter elements of species. <clears throat> it's testing in a sense. It's A B testing itself at all times, and it's creating a very dynamic interactive system that tries to optimize for the resources and the energy it has at hand. And that optimization at all times, in some ways, will be a model for everything from supply chains to team structures. You can grow and shrink things so much more easily when they are connected and when you've got reference signals to how they are operating in a healthy way. And when you can spot new influences. Some of you are probably thinking about what this means for data collection because it becomes clearly very important to get a good real-time sense of your products, your customers, and your partners in any industrial endeavor in a way that you didn't have to worry about when you manufactured things on an annual or even a five-year basis. <clears throat> in this more ecologically-minded world, it's decisions are made in real-time relationships rise and fall in a much faster pace. So I'd like to open up that aspect of it and how to think about this by asking a riddle of our audience out there. Uh, what is the strangest thing the internet could do? What is something the internet could do that would really blow your mind, bother you, otherwise, you know, uh, help you think about you know, this in a whole new way? What is the single weirdest thing the internet could do? Answer, be exactly the same. Imagine going on the web and it was all the same email, it was all the same Twitter, it was all the same Facebook, it was all the same interactions, like nothing was actually different. That would be really, really strange. That would just seem like a different machine from what you were used to. You'd hold your computer upside down and shake it, wondering why it wasn't moving. And the essence of it is change. And optimization or adaptation to a continuously changing environment. That's a really unique space when you think about it because it starts to reorganizing our thinking a whole lot in our work. So first off, how do we organize around products and the treatment of products and services? For those of you who are familiar with the IT side of your department, there's something called DevOps, which has risen up in light of the cloud revolution. <laughs> And in the case of DevOps, it's an effort to bring closer together different parts of software teams to have them create and work in real time, testing and probing and launching all the time to optimize, to create faster, to work faster, and to learn from each other in real time and adjust all the time. It's much more of an ecosystem view of how software gets created. You see, other aspects of this starting to come out into the rest of the world with real-time auctions for all sorts of products, which is dynamic pricing or subscription models um, becoming more and more popular for all sorts of products and services from Netflix to book relationships to um, <clears throat> uh, your CRM software. Uh, the subscription is a sense of a dynamic relationship with the customer that can be adjusted on either side through payments or through changing the software itself to offer different services. So you're in this new dynamism. This obviously creates a really important status for data for a manager. For those of you who took accounting in um, business school, you probably learned CMMMTYM Cash OCF, excuse me, cash flow matters more than your mother. I would like to update that to DM version, data matters more than your mother. It is going to rule the business. How do you collect data? How do you react to new information? How can we have an AI strategy in this AI being the strong computing technology that looks at huge amounts of data and follows, finds novel patterns? that you can leverage in that data. Character recognition, object recognition, language recognition, all sorts of different patterns that at a very high speed can help find new ways of making efficient or uh, making novel various parts of your products and services. This means that 
even in creating a product, you're probably going to need to have developers on hand to talk about what data a connected product will collect, even as early as the first product meeting, thinking about what will we collect? What will be connected? What will we change in real time in this product? What will we learn from the customer? How will we protect privacy? How will we have ethical constraints inside this product? Because reputational cost is so high in a real-time environment. Uh, how can we collect the most high-value data and how will we store it? All these are questions that you can't just leave to an IT department anymore. They have to bring IT and the comparative advantage, the competitive stature of the company in a closer alignment so that you can move forward together. And then collaboration. The connection isn't just of machines and computers or computers and computers. It's people and computers and people and people via computers, meaning that people will be freed up from rote tasks to do higher value things that I'm sorry, computers will just never do because computers aren't really very good at inventing things. Computers don't have taste. They don't choose anything that they're not programmed to do. There is no inspiration in these machines. You may believe in the singularity and the Terminator and Skynet. There's no evidence that there's ever going to be general AI in our lifetimes. There's going to be high levels of automation that will get the grunt work out of the way. And we see aspects of this now when we have uh, collaborative software that enables us to very quickly work with each other and do high value human work together, creative work together in a way that would have taken hours, you know, 10 years ago and weeks 10 years before that and months, a century before that for people to do. So that acceleration of higher value creative work will be something one should count on but it also means you need to think about bringing people together through skills and capabilities and found knowledge more than through the functional strictures of the current siloed work environment. And the other thing that's changing as you move to a dynamic environment, and perhaps the more important thing, is the customer is changing as well. That we're seeing, excuse me, there we go. In 1998, the, cust the customer uses the internet somewhat like a catalog seeking access. In 10 years later, flat, flash forward, and you've got people starting to go mobile, people communicating with each other, each other. You have this talk about this great conversation. People are advocates, we say, and they expect to be heard and they expect companies to listen to them and react to them. What happens as we move into a cloud world where there is computation everywhere and we are always connected? Well, as I've indicated before, in many ways, people expect devices to be personalized. They personalize them for themselves. Your smartphone looks different from my smartphone because my I've made mine like something I want. My software looks different. My car looks different. My home thermostat looks different. Anything connected with this downloadable capability looks different. It's personalized and people expect to be seen and understood. They also expect to have their privacy respected. And we've seen regulators go at this and we've seen a lot of social tension around this and it becomes a manager's role to figure out how to walk that line and do both things. Anticipate the customer, have empathy for the customer and respect the autonomy of the customer. It's a great challenge and we will be working it out for some time to come. But people expect it now. They expect to have personalization. They expect to be seen and heard. They expect to be anticipated. And they expect to consume things, perhaps on a subscription basis, perhaps by purchasing, almost as if they're having experiences more than they're consuming products. If you think about what an Airbnb or an Uber is doing, they are enabling the consumer not to get a taxi, but to get a ride. They are enabling the consumer not to get a hotel room, but to get a nice place to sleep. We're moving into this very experience-driven kind of world. Um, one way to term it is we're moving from a world of nouns to a world of verbs, that the action, the experience becomes the high-value object 
and you the, the way you enrich someone's life with your product becomes more and more important to you. So I've covered a lot of ground and in closing I want to talk about some of the touchstones to remember as we move forward, as we think about the new ecology, the new work environment, the new technologically informed market, and the customer revolution of a customer that expects to be understood and empathized with. Uh, as Diane Green said, the head of Google Cloud, security is the number one worry, AI is the number one opportunity. That data is rich, data must be secure, it's part of your promise to the customer that you are ensuring security, AI is the means to better and faster product development, better customer relationships. You see all of the big clouds working on all of these areas. Uh, the flexibility that I talked about in virtualization or the DevOps model, this ability to assemble and disassemble, to change fast, to interoperate, becomes highly important to individuals. And this is one reason that you see a explosion of open source software and products over the last 10 or 15 years. In open source, you have, in effect, self-assembling standards bodies that elect the best kind of products and the best kind of software products to be using at that time so that um, things can work together better, that people can work together better, and collaborative tools help in this as well. You'll see a greater need for connectivity ad hoc than we have before, and these will become vital business tools. And lastly, and this is a very important thought, being able to forgive yourself and your team. At Working at this scale, one thing I've seen is that cloud companies build for imperfection. They strive for perfection, they strive for high performance, but they do what's called error budgeting, which is a way of thinking about um, the point at which we allow something to go before it has to be fixed, before we shut down. Because in a large, complicated ecological system, there are too many contingencies to have the same kind of 100% delivery you got in a classical manufacturing system. That the product is never finished, the product can always be improved, the software can always be improved, there will be errors if there is, an error, no one is to blame. The important part is to surface the information and share it out as much as possible so you can improve as quickly as possible. And on the customer relationship side, I think that there's a corollary in what Jeff Bezos called the divine disconsent of his customers, discontent of his customers, who continuously seek to have a better product that don't ever have a final scent of contentment. And that, along with this technology basis which influences that kind of customer expectation will influence us as marketers, as engineers, as product people, as take your pick um, in the business. We are at the early stages. There is much to learn. There is much to do. I personally think this is an extremely exciting time. I can't think of anyone in history who wouldn't give their eye teeth to be with us now. That's about what I wanted to talk about, and I've come to the time allotted. We have about 20, 25 quest minutes for questions. Is that right, Allie? Hello? Oh, can you guys all hear me? Yes, I've got you now. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, so thank you so much, Quentin. So we'll move on to our Q&A portion of the presentation. We've received many great questions, so we'll continue to take your questions through the remainder of the hour and answer as many as we can. A reminder to use the questions module in the GoToWebinar panel or on Twitter using hashtag MITSMREvent. So I'll kick off the first question for you, Quentin. Um, we had someone ask about, are we advancing faster than our ethics can be developed? Or how can we ensure that we don't cross 
any important lines before ethics around some of these computing, cloud computing issues, larger data issues are defined? Okay, let me try and break that down. First off, I think that is the $64,000 question of our time. Are we moving faster than our ethics can catch up? I think that's always been a tension, you know, and we do have a certain advantage now, which is I don't think at the time of the printing press or the Industrial Revolution, people could have seen the patterns that we can see now. We actually are moving ahead and reshaping the world, but we can also do it more mindfully because we know this is happening. We have these antecedents to study and we should study them. Um, and things are more publicized and reputations matter more to people. Reputations are a kind of currency of de dependability in a changing world. So that I think ethics and dependability start to become very important to people. The exigencies of earning to the quarter cause people to cut corners, twas ever thus. But I'm going to try and stay hopeful. I really hope our political leaders um, become more attuned to what the technology is doing to the world around them. Uh, as much as I worry about the technologists, I think there are other big players in the system who need to have a great awareness of what regulatory responsibilities are here as well. Great, thank you so much, Quentin. That's really helpful. And we also had a couple other questions that touched on the DevOps portion where you had mentioned sort of software engineering practice that you know unifies the development and operations team. Right, and organization. right. It's a somewhat so, metaphorical take, but the growth of Agile, the growth of DevOps, CI, CD, these are all ways of manufacturing and launching and testing software at a faster clip. Exactly. So one question we had from the audience was, how important do you see DevOps in maximizing development in the cloud? And is that something, you know, can, can you speak a little bit to what needs to be in place for some of these migrations? I think um, it, the model generally of being responsive, collaborating well, and testing and adjusting, because we could get into the various, you know, disciplines of what DevOps is, the particulars, but the overall idea that people need to work closely together in building and launching and receiving information and changing is critical in moving into new areas. I don't think the older models are responsive enough to their environments for many, many tasks. Obviously, there are certain functions for which this may not be appropriate. I wouldn't, you know, necessarily build a nuclear power plant using this model, but for many of our functions, I think, you know, things that are agile, flexible, can take inputs and see how things are being used and then adjust to them are critical for functioning in this world. Terrific, thank you so much. Um, I also had another question come in about Sort of reskilling and adapting. So, what skills do you believe will be required to adapt into the new workforce that you had described a little bit earlier in the presentation? Well, I can tell you this much. I have um, been thinking about this for a number of years, and I have two sons, uh, both of whom have graduated college, one in theology and one in computer science. I have faith in them both. I think they're both going to find their way. I told them both that whatever they did, they had to take at least one statistics course. Because I think whatever area of life you're going to, there's going to have to be a lot of thinking around data and a lot of thinking around how data is used and how statistics are used. It's just going to be shot through every aspect of life. Now, in terms of reskilling, in some ways, the model should not be reskilling as much as continuous learning. The educational model we have is, you know, a kind of agrarian hybrid, uh, agrarian industrial hybrid model. And we need to have an educational model that reflects an environment of 
continuous change and continuous learning. Uh, people talk about this, but we're not enacting it in the system in very successful ways. And I'll leave you with this, this question anyway. I'll leave with a, a somewhat unusual thought that I've noticed working in technology. We need to teach people that being wrong is not a source of guilt, shame, and frustration. Frankly, the only way you learn math is to be wrong a lot. The only way you learn anything in a way is to be wrong a lot, to have your assumptions tested. And we have a school system that doesn't engage people very well that way. And we have to more broadly, some of the smartest people I know enjoy finding out that they were wrong because it means they're authentically going to learn something new. And so we have to create an educational mindset in which people, I'm not talking about cheering because you got an F. I'm talking about not getting discouraged because some things take a long time to learn and enjoying the process of learning for learning's sake, because that's going to be a hallmark of successful people in this world. I think that's very helpful. And I think that also speaks to some of the questions and correct me if I'm wrong, that we're getting around sort of how can executives and managers prepare organizations to deal right. with these kinds of critical shifts. No blame culture. Like, like yeah. if you make an error and you surface it, that is not, you shouldn't consider that a moment of shame or a career killer. You should consider that a benefit you're offering to the institution. You know, you need high trust environments and that includes this no blame culture. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's certainly a shift. And I think another shift that was noted in a question is you mentioned the transition to the cloud has brought on, you know, has coincided with this customer re revolution. And that requires, you know, change in mindset and behaviors for both employees and leaders. Can you speak a little bit more to that portion? Uh, yeah, I think there is actually a parallel with what you're saying because um, I, ha I came up before I was in journalism, I was in the publishing world. And there, as in many parts of industry, one wants to delight the customer, but one also keeps the customer at arm's length. And that model may not be successful because in some ways customers are participating in product creation in ways that we hadn't seen before. Their behavior is influencing what you make next. And not just through some focus group survey, but in real time, their use changes how the product gets used and how the product gets shaped. And you'll see this more and more, particularly as 3D printing arises to allow for more and more personalization. So there is this um, level of customer focus and customer participation that has to be breached. And I think that will likewise go for effective partnering in this business, uh, that better partner communication will be quite important. That's great. Does that answer your question? That, or? that does, it does. Okay. And I think we're getting a lot of questions and comments about how it seems like there there needs to be training and budget and education around the shifts that are happening and the kind of mental models and also, you know, the actual technology and what people need to be up to speed on. Well, look, you know, mm -hmm. these things do tend to sort themselves out in a very simple way. The mm -hmm. companies that engage effectively produce higher profit margins. What does that tell you? <laughs> you know, there, there are certain realities that don't change as the world <laughs> changes and develops, right? When you see your competitors doing this and they are succeeding, there will be a call to action throughout industries. That makes sense, but it, do you see any, we did get a question about people or organizations and slash countries that might sort of be ahead of the curve in terms of moving towards this new model, uh, both from an educational standpoint and regulatory framework. Um, well, I, that, that's a really good question. I think early days, but um, we do see a lot of interesting breakdowns. You know, if you look at China, which had heavy, heavy manufacturing bias, it's interesting to see how they've transited over to um, a lot of online businesses, um, mobile payments businesses ahead of uh, the West in some ways, but also the way in which manufacturing has been modified in a place like Shenzhen, where they're just throwing physical products out 
at a rate other people throw out online software, just variations being thrown up all the time. And if it hits, they continue the manufacturing of it to a larger and larger extent. It's just this furious production cycle like nothing you've seen before. But then in Europe, you've got uh, probably the most developed or um, advanced fraught, whatever word you want, around the role of the individual inside this larger system, which seems to help inside their culture. Uh, in the United States, you've got this free-for-all of a lot more entrepreneurism and a lot more companies being created that are of some size and rising up and displacing the others. I hesitate to say anybody has this stuff wired because, again, in 1480, you wouldn't have been able to say, oh, you know, in 10 years, the new world's going to be discovered, and that's really going to shake up this translation business. I think you know you, you could be inside something like that here, where there is some third thing, some external influence that rises up and really knows how to take advantage of the role of data, of the role of flexibility, of the role of kind of continuous engagement. But if you can't see it, you can't work with it. I just think you need to look at the world around you the things you do, your tasks, and wonder how data and flexibility and continuous engagement can be best applied. I think that's very helpful, and and it for what it's worth, I, I totally agree. It's still it's you know early days, but we do seem to be in this kind of gold rush era when it comes to moving to the cloud. What's going to happen in the next few years? Um, so it's a product. This this is a product of many, many years. Nobody's got this thing wired 100%. And if you look at the market share of the cloud players or the revenues of the cloud players against the overall IT spend, I think any of them would say that it's, um, it's a fairly open field right now and it's a very competitive field. Um, and I do, I, I did get a couple questions also around the fact that cloud has solved an infrastructure bottleneck, but a new bottleneck is in the actual app development and bringing new tech solutions to market. So if you're a manager, you know, a CEO, CIO, uh, looking towards a cloud migration with, you know, 1,500, 1,800 apps, um, you're going to have almost as many questions as you have apps when you're, when you're approaching right. this. So right, right, right. Do you have any perspectives in managing the business outcomes? Of I think there is a, yeah, there's a, a kind of classic, you know, manufacturing solution to this in some ways, which is automate as much of the unproductive work as possible. In the case of cloud style software, you know, use containers, use Kubernetes, use, cloud, you know, container management technologies to, you know, a, make as many functions as possible, replicable, automatable, and frankly, more secure because you can fix the patches in a single update and not have to manually do it. Keep people focused on the creative work and the interesting work as you try to automate as much of the software development as you can. And that way you can keep up and focus more sharply on what really differentiates your company and products. Great, thank you. And um, I think we've come up on our final final questions, and I think we've answered for the majority of these that had, you know, kind of common common threads between them. Um, Quentin, for you, what do you see kind of right now as being the most exciting, the exciting entity in cloud computing, and and you know, right now in the age of the cloud? Oh boy, um, you know. <laughs> I like a lot of what I see here. Um, the advent of artificial intelligence and the ways in which artificial intelligence is following a kind of classic curve. One I heard about years ago when I was at Corning, and it was the kind of growth of optical computing in those days. But Corning, this big glass manufacturer, a guy said to me, you know, what happens across industry and business is really dependable. 
somebody gets inspiration, almost like an artistic level. This individual gets a view and he takes it to his lab with his team and they work out experiments. And this discovery becomes peer reviewed science. It's published and reviewed and people go, yeah, okay, that's an interesting law of nature in society that we can kind of depend on and we can build something against it, build a product, build a service, build a feature, you know, work against it as a scientific law, whatever. And then people engineer it. It's almost like there's, a, you know, again, these increasing uh, concentric circles of society. More people come in and they engineer it. And then it encounters the market. And if it's very useful, it gets engineered into a mass manufacturing product. And so think about that in terms of what's happened with AI, where there were just a few researchers in the 80s and 90s. And then thanks to cloud and thanks to individuals uploading a lot of data into the cloud and cheaper computing, it became something that was engineered. And now it's moving into that curve of mass usage. Um, there are products coming out now that are easier and easier to use so that this isn't simply the purview of a few PhD scientists. Artificial intelligence, which again is just pattern finding, it is not you know crazy machines with a mind of their own. These would be human controlled things and humans have responsibilities and need to think about their responsibilities in them. Artificial intelligence will be perhaps the most important and impactful element of this overall tech proposition. Thank you so much, Quentin. That's, a, I think, a really great perspective and way of, um, you know, leaving this where we, we have a lot to think about, but it's an exciting time. It's um, nice to know that among all this change, history can still teach us something. I totally agree. <laughs> So that concludes today's Q&A session, and thank you so much again to our speaker. Over the next few days, please look out for a feedback survey we'll send via email. We greatly appreciate your thoughts and opinions on this. For a reminder that a recording of this program will be available within three to four business days. And with that, it concludes our program. Thank you for attending. Thank you to our presenter, Quentin Hardy, and thanks to our sponsor, Cloudera. Thank you all.